Welcome to The Record. I'm Mark Maxwell. The uh, politics of power and public safety come into clearer focus as St. Louis has a new top cop, Mayor Tashara Jones, announcing Robert Tracy from Wilmington, Delaware, to take over the city's police force starting in the new year. She announced Chief Tracy at a press conference from City Hall just yesterday. I am proud to announce that St. Louis has selected Chief Robert Tracy as our next Chief of Police. Mayor Tashara Jones announced her pick for the city's top cop Wednesday morning, tapping an outsider to take over the city's police force for the first time ever. We all know that St. Louis can be a bit uh, unique when it comes to new people. While Tracy may be an outsider in St. Louis, he's more of an insider in Democratic cities. He investigated gun crimes in the New York Police Department for 23 years, and when Rahm Emanuel hired NYPD's Gary McCarthy to take over Chicago's police department, McCarthy brought Tracy with him. When McCarthy was fired, Tracy then took over the police department in then former Vice President Joe Biden's hometown. When I started my work in Wilmington, it was dubbed Murder Town USA by Newsweek. Murder Town USA by Newsweek. However, by January of 2019, the headlines read, from murder town to turnaround town. Tracy's success with crime stats punched his ticket back to the White House last summer as the president highlighted police efforts to crack down on rogue gun dealers and reduce violent crime. It's a very small percentage of persons committing most of the violent crime. So we don't have dangerous communities. We have a small percentage of the dangerous people in those communities. At Wednesday morning's press conference, Tracy echoed Mayor Jones's calls for 911 call diversion and violence interruption programs but gave this stern warning to repeat offenders. You know what, if they're gonna cause harm to the community, we're gonna, we're gonna have to arrest them. And his message to officers? If the morale is, is somewhat low, uh, we gotta take a look at that and see why. Tracy says his record of retention speaks for itself. None of my officers left. Despite the state and surrounding county trying to poach his police. I wasn't having those issues and our officers weren't leaving and we were getting more officers coming. And that's Robert Tracy. You're meeting him there. He'll start at, on January 9th as the chief of police in St. Louis. Joining us now for instant reaction on the record is <laughs> Alderwoman Shamim Clark Hubbard. Good to have you with us. Nice to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. What did you make of the hire? Uh, you know, I was watching it. I was following as much as I could, looking at the research of the different backgrounds of the different um, opportunities, the different candidates that we had, and, you know, listening to the press conference yesterday, I was definitely taking, um, getting excited about some of the things that he said. Uh, one of the things that stood out most to me is that he said he would be an ally with civilian oversight here in the city of St. Louis, as you know. Um, I worked hard along with my colleagues to pass Board Bill 47 uh, as amended that was about civilian oversight, and now we're doing 137 in response to the lawsuits um, from police departments. So right now, there is not the form of civilian oversight that you would like to see in the city. And well, there is a legal challenge yes. as well. What is the latest expectation on that? It, is it, uh, I think a court may have even said, hold on, mm -hmm. don't go any farther with this just yet. Yes. Are you still optimistic that this thing can survive constitutional muster and the judicial scrutiny that lies ahead? Absolutely, and in response, um, I introduced uh, about a week ago, Board Bill 137, um, that has some changes in it so that we would be definitely in um, compliance with SB 26 and made some other changes that came directly out of the conversations from POA and ESOP. And so we're working towards getting that um, introduced and moved as well as going back to court on the um, lawsuit. And we like to, uh, just so our people watching, uh, POA, the Police Officers Association, yes. the Police Union, and yes. ESOP, the Ethical Society of Police, yes. uh, they've been calling for greater transparency, uh, the Police Union. Sometimes, uh, not, not always, I mean, transparency can be uncomfortable. Absolutely. How would you describe the, the relationship, has it broken down, uh, of trust between mm -hmm. police and the public, or what has been the history, why the need for this change? Well, we know the history. This work started over 20 years ago, prior, alone prior to my um, tenure here at the board. And this was just a continuation to build capacity in the already existing civilian oversight board. I think that the people that we have in place now are going to make all the difference with Commissioner Brumman and the board that will get in place with this. Um, I think transparency builds trust um, and builds communication, builds trust, and that's what we want to build with the civilian oversight board. This has been a busy week for you, a busy yes. few weeks. We're going to get to a lot of that, uh, yes. things that went through City Hall. Uh, throughout, throughout this conversation, mm -hmm. but because so many people are watching the police, I want to play mm -hmm. that soundbite for you in just a moment. Mm -hmm. And for you, our viewers, from new Chief Tracy, again, he'll start his new role January 9th. Mm -hmm. uh, before he came, uh, went to Wilmington, Delaware, he served as the crime control strategist in Chicago's police department. Before that, he served alongside Gary McCarthy in a senior post in the New York 
Police Department, and we asked him about that civilian oversight. That's something that Chicago has pushed for, New mm -hmm. York has pushed for. Uh, we asked him about that need for greater civilian oversight at the press conference yesterday. Take a listen. On transparency, you're, you're coming to a city where a lot of activists, a lot of voters have called for civilian oversight of the police department. Transparency can be uncomfortable, but what is your attitude toward <coughs> civilian oversight specifically, and will you be an ally to those people who feel the police department could have more oversight from the people who live here? Well, I've come from departments with oversight. Uh, you have to work with them. Uh, you know, if you want to build a community trust, you know, the working relationship, the one reporter talked about some things that might not, might have been in conflict or not having a great relationship. I come in from the outside. If there's an oversight, uh, they're here, they have a job to do, and we're going to make sure it's done fairly, and we're going to cooperate with any oversight that there is, because that's transparency. Uh, you you got to make sure that the people trust us and they trust the system that's in place. What I am is a fair man. I will make sure investigations are done fairly, and I will cooperate and my, my officers with any oversight that's needed to make sure we can build trust. There you have it. Build trust is his goal, but I want to put that soundbite that you're hearing, his mm -hmm. best ambitions, Yes. His aspirations on day one, yes. side by side with some criticism from the city council president where he comes from in mm -hmm. Wilmington, Delaware. Take a look at this quote mm -hmm. from uh, Ernest Congo, who is the city council president in Wilmington. He says Chief Tracy, quote, has demonstrated resistance and a pattern of failure to provide information when requested, including any ideas to increase communication, transparency, diversity and police reform. Now, I'm not going to ask you to evaluate or pass judgment yeah. on the allegation made there. Yes. But I will ask you if that behavior described there occurs under his watch in St. Louis, yes. what will happen? He will absolutely, and I 100% feel that he will be held accountable. I mean, I'm sure he came into a climate that he knows already has this at the forefront, already has the idea of true civilian oversight, but also true support of the police department um, in, in, his, uh, in his foresight. So I think that I can't, again, speak to that person's um, perception or whatever, whatever made them feel that way, but I'm a little bit more optimistic in some place, sometimes to a fault, that I believe that he did his research as well as we did and that he'll come here um, with an open mind. With an open mind. And a lot of people are looking for uh, safer uh, communities yes. in St. Louis and putting a lot of hopes into the new chief that's coming in here. Uh, I want to point to some of the track record that we could find from Chief Tracy and get your reaction. And again, okay. we'll, we'll move on to some other developments at City Hall this week. Uh, Mr. Tracy comes to town boasting some big statistics and Mayor Jones appears to believe them. Her, uh, her office issued a press release even citing many of those statistics that he takes credit for from his time in Chicago. He was Gary McCarthy's crime control strategist and someone close to the department at that time described Tracy as McCarthy's right hand man and called him the great manipulator, the one in control of all the data. I want to show you this cover story that ran in the spring of 2014 in Chicago, right as Mayor Rahm Emanuel was ramping up his bid for re-election. Reporters David Bernstein and Noah Isaacson pulled back the curtain on what was really going on behind the scenes in that city's crime statistics. You can see that violent crime numbers had been dropping consistently over time. We showed you that chart. Look at the gray area on the right. That's the column where Tracy and Gary McCarthy arrive in Chicago and boom, you see a big drop off in that spike. Chicago Magazine report called it uh, the drop in crime uh, unprecedented. Some of his detractors called it unbelievable. You see that quote there. They say crime hadn't just fallen, it had free fallen across several and major, major categories. But how? Let's go further in this story. According to police figures, the number of these crimes plunged by 56% citywide. The story goes on, it says uh, it borders on the miraculous. Let's go farther. Uh, it says that Chicago found dozens of other crimes, including serious felonies like robberies, burglaries, and assaults, were misclassified, downgraded, or made to vanish altogether. This is under his watch. He was the guy in charge. He was Gary McCarthy's right-hand man, mm -hmm. and there were crimes where they had a dead body in some cases. They had evidence of foul play, and that case would vanish from the murder statistics. Does that sound like transparency to you? That absolutely doesn't sound like transparency to me, but also I would never speak to just a quote or any kind of blurb or soundbite that somebody had. I mean, data is what would show that, and I believe that the administration has done their best to follow the data. That's what's reported to us. 
And so at some point we either chase someone else's story or we dig in and try to fight, uh, work collectively to bring our own communities and our police force forward. We won't go all the way back to New York, but there, the comp stat uh, data, which is what he's pointing to, the big mm -hmm. computer where everybody in St. Louis will one day be able to go and look and see where yeah. crimes are happening hour by hour, mm -hmm. what kinds of crimes, and you can sort of see it. That's his pledge to the public of this is transparency in action. But if mm -hmm. the data being input is garbage, then the data that's, that we're looking at is garbage. It has to be real. Yeah. How do you ensure that part of it? I believe in our police department. I know it's not a popular stance to take, but I have great relationships with our police department now. He's coming into our police department. I don't for a second think our police department will come and let, the, let him turn that around, turn everything around. So, you know, I, I just, I don't subscribe to this like he'll be some kind of boogeyman sitting at a computer erasing the data. I, again, the relationships I have with SLMPD, um, I believe that they wouldn't let that happen, even if he tried. Mm -hmm. And perhaps if some of them feel the pressure that officers felt in Chicago or that officers felt in New York to juke the spa, uh, stats or to play spin doctor, that uh, I suspect some of us might hear about that. Uh, either Absolutely. I, sus I believe we'll hear about it. I, don't, I just don't believe especially the, the distance and the time and the communication and relationships and the trust that we're working to build. We, we and then when I say we in St. Louis, I don't believe that we'll let somebody come in and tear it down. A lot of people watching with big hopes to see this new transition Me take too. place. Is it fair to watch with a, a skeptical eye? That's a personal perception. I don't look at things that way. But again, they tell me I'm optimistic to a fault sometimes. So I'll be watching, not following rumors, relationships, and perceptions, and people's thoughts, you know, but I'll be watching the data. All right, perhaps no greater influence drives uh, de crimes of desperation, especially other than poverty. And something in City Hall this week uh, took and tried to apply an, an Endeavor uh, solution uh, toward mm -hmm. uh, eradicating poverty. It might not happen overnight, but St. Louis will soon roll out a new benefit to roughly 440 parents uh, who have children in public schools in St. Louis. This mm -hmm. benefit, a guaranteed basic income that will last 18 months. Some critics at City Hall initially raised questions, again, about transparency, not just mm -hmm. in where the money will go, but how it will ultimately be spent. Take a listen. Mm -hmm. What I want is the information, how it's spent. Alderwoman Sharon Tyus criticized a lack of transparency in who got the first round of direct cash payments and where that money ultimately wound up. In my ward, everybody who I talked to said they had they did not know anyone who got the first 500. I'm still trying to figure out where the last $500 went to. Advocates of a guaranteed basic income at Missouri Jobs with Justice claim most people in poverty spent stimulus funds on basic needs like gas, groceries, or basic bills. Alderman Tom Oldenburg pointed to the fine print in their study. 33% of the, of the folks did either an ATM withdrawal or transferred it to another account. There is really no way to track that after the fact, right, other than, other than followed up in a survey, correct? Absolutely. Okay and believing them. Okay. This pilot program promises a guaranteed basic income of $500 per month to parents with kids in St. Louis public schools from households under 170 percent of the poverty line. The board approved enough benefits to last 18 months for roughly 440 people with no strings attached on how they spend it. According to the last census, 57,400 people in the poverty level that would qualify for this $500. Who's going to win the lottery? Was it going to have like a drawing? There is no program on earth that services everybody that qualifies for it or everybody that applies for it. None. All the way down to the food lines. When we have food lines that we have to say, hey, we got to cut it off right here. So that means you don't do anything for anybody or you don't believe in anything for anybody. That's Alderwoman Shamim Clark Hubbard making the case to start small, and uh, that was you just uh, a few days ago mm -hmm. at City Hall there. Yeah. Uh, you said that that was some of the critical, skeptical view from some of your colleagues, but you did mention that uh, the debate was a little easier than you thought it was going to be. What did you think you were in for? I was ready to argue not only gu guaranteed basic income, but the other 10 apportionments out of this bill, um, the, the changes, the impact, the resources that will be served, um, the needs that will be met through Board Bill um, 116 Committee. So it was amended. I was ready to argue every single point. As actually, my colleague 
Tom Oldenburg, Alderman Oldenburg, who I have so much respect for, came up to me at the beginning of the meeting and said, be ready, I'm going to ask you about every single item. And then he said he was teasing me. I was ready. And then he rolled over and voted for it. And he said he was teasing me. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's what communication, that's what the legislative process does. The, the, the legislative branch here, the uh, Board of Aldermen, does have to carve up a lot of this extra COVID money, and that was a $52 million chunk of it, a lot of it going yeah. to federally qualified health centers, yes. which can also help people in poverty uh, have access to health care. Um, so it wasn't just this, but I think this is the new thing. It's the mm -hmm. novelty. So mm -hmm. people are naturally gravitating their attention toward it. Mm -hmm. uh, is it fair to want to know, these are government funds. We don't really know who, who precisely they're going to. We know the group of people. Mm -hmm. We don't know the individuals and we don't exactly know how they're spending it all. It, it's, it's a bit of a transparency blind spot. Um, other benefit programs are very carefully regulated and other benefit programs sometimes even have fraud in them. How do you get at that in this case, or do you just not worry about it? I, well, personally, Mark, I don't worry about it. I believe in guaranteed based income because I know what an extra $500 could do for a family's bottom line. And I do not think I'm in any role or position to judge how a family would choose to provide for their family through that $500 payment. Hey, do they follow where the food goes? Do they follow if somebody throws the food away or takes it to somebody else or puts it in their own pantry? Do they follow any other, other I mean, you, precisely when you think about it, it's really kind of, um, nannying is the word that I've heard used to say this person and this family that clearly qualifies for this, might I add, they are working families. You have to be a working family to make this th meet the threshold or not meet the threshold, which is why you qualify. Why do they have to report what they do with their next $500 and the other working person does not have to report what they did with their $500 for their family? No, it just doesn't um, add up to me. And I know that that's just a fundamental thing for some people that, that that's how their mind works and that's the position they take. But for me, I think that a fam the assurance and the confidence that it gives to a family that they'll be able to budget that in for the next 18 months on what they can do and the change they can make is what m makes more sense to me than to be worried about worrying, following them what they're going to do with it. Uh, should the city track these expenditures? Uh, how, and by that I mean in, in the first wave of uh, stimulus funds, $500 mm -hmm. went out, there were cards yeah. that people could use and the city could see. The reason we have this data about how it was spent was because just like your regular credit card, mm -hmm. th that credit card processing company sees how you spent your money and they can break it down into bulk categories. Mm -hmm. uh, is there some interest in knowing again how people use this money or how will they receive the benefit? Is there some interest in people knowing? Probably for some people. But for me, again, I personally do not believe that I should be asking a person to mm -hmm. show me specifically where they use that. Hey, the, the item about the, or the point rather that was made about the ATM, how do you know that a person didn't take the cash out and then go to the gas station? They how don't. do you know that a person didn't take the cash out and then go to the grocery store where they, if they're unbanked or just banked, they might have gone and paid their utility bill there. There's a reporting that comes through the testimony, which you couldn't pick up in the hearing, what I said after that but their testimony and what they said and I believe them mm -hmm. is what they uh, you know is what we absolutely have that can track it now other than that hey in the world there's misuse in the world there's fraud but do you not do a program because you base it against your own judgment about what somebody might do or not do that's not how I believe we that's not the role I believe we play I understand what you're saying and, and certainly you're making the case that the extra budget breathing room makes that positive yeah. difference for people uh, but if you were to use the analogy, take a whole city agency mm -hmm. and 33% of its money was converted into cash and stuffed into envelopes, no government would be allowed to operate that way. That, that wouldn't be a, a, a reasonable use of government resources. This is a limited pool of government resources, mm -hmm. one-time money from COVID. Is there a hope that this can parlay into something else down the line and that it can be expanded? How, how does that happen? I don't know how far your crystal ball sees into the future. <laughs> But how, how can we go from one-time limited funds from COVID from the federal government into guaranteeing mm -hmm. this basic income beyond the 18 months? Yeah, there, well, there is a push, and we know that we've, we've done the research and looked on different um, cities and, and um, populations that have used this, not only through their own raising their own private funds to do something like this, but also pushing for a nationwide, pushing for policy up this in Washington. 
So I think that, you know, this is a pilot for a reason. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're going to follow and track it. Hey, we learned something from DCA. If you look at the report that's open online, it's been open online, you can see the not only how we did and how we tracked it, but the lessons we learned from that. And that's what I believe we're going to carry into this now pilot for a guaranteed basic income here. And hey, let's talk about this. When, when you do bailouts, national bailouts, when the government, when Washington, D.C. does bailouts, do they go and go to that CEO's house and say, hey, let me see that checkbook. What did you do with that? What did you do with it? So how are you now going to go into these people's household for $500? That's going to make what I believe, what I know for sure, some, a difference for them. Yeah, right. Uh, there's the question about stock buybacks. There's a lot of questions in the financial system about how people uh, reap the rewards. This would be a way of reaping the rewards from the, the different end of the economic ladder, so to speak, if there were a tiered system, of, I suppose. Right. But uh, perhaps that's part of the point. Right. These are taxpayers. You know, this whole we're throwing money away for people that don't pay tax. They, they meet a threshold because these are working families and they meet either meet or, or are under the threshold, which is what makes them applicable for this tax money that, hey, if we didn't have them in this city, we wouldn't have applied. We wouldn't have been able to get this much money anyway. When we were uh, when you were previewing this debate mm -hmm. just a few days before the vote, you suggested that these People who, uh, who receive this benefit will have to report it as income, mm -hmm. but it's so early yet we still don't know uh, if the federal government or maybe the state government might, might give or grant a waiver okay. so that while, yes, they report it as income, they don't have to pay taxes on it. We don't really know that yet. Mm -hmm. um, what do you tell people in that position who might be banking on that extra $500 or hoping to win it? Mm -hmm. uh, will they, should they have to pay an extra, is it gonna be $350? take home mm -hmm. after the 500 or is it going to be the full 500? How do we know that? We don't know that yet. You're right, but we are working with uh, benefit indicators and different, th you know, different people that will be in place to watch and follow that mm -hmm. so we can go forward. But look, I'm a mother of five. The $250 I got during the uh, pandemic made a difference to me. So, you know, the idea of comparing it, well, you won't get 500, but you'll get this for a family when you're trying to budget in and make ends meet, whatever they can get extra is going to make a difference. All right. Uh, how do you like the changes so far at the board? There's a new president. Have you noticed the difference? I haven't noticed much difference only because I had a working relationship with President Green prior to her becoming President Green. So I'm just keeping um, in a working relationship that I'm proud of that I've built with all my colleagues for that matter. And so um, I just continue to move forward uh, collectively. I think yesterday, was it? No, Tuesday showed yeah. some differences clearly on how we came together on some things. So, you know. Some people noticed the way she realigned the committee uh, assignments mm -hmm. might have been advantageous to her agenda or to mm -hmm. her allies, mm -hmm. progressives put mm -hmm. in positions of power. Did you, mm -hmm. did you see that? I, um, I'm going to be honest, Mark, because I was asked, like all of my colleagues, about changing or moving in different committees, and I um, said that I'm happy where I am, so I didn't pay much close attention, and my working relationship that I have with President Green, I don't know her A agenda. Step. Yeah, I just don't <laughs> know her agenda like that to say, yeah, she did that to, you know, to do her agenda. I just don't know. I follow, I follow the agenda of the people that I was elected down there to serve. Would you be surprised to hear some of your colleagues can't quite figure out where you land on the sort of left-right political spectrum per se. Like mm -hmm. they, they say that you're f friendly with a lot of the different members and you have mm -hmm. alliances built up. With, how, are you a progressive? Are you a moderate? How do you describe your brand of politics? I don't, I, I don't think there's a name for my brand of politics yet. I think I'm new and different, which is why I titled and dubbed myself a new 26. I, I, you know, one of the things that I follow in is my grandfather's footsteps, and he taught me to always follow the greater good, follow the data, help the greater good. And so with me, when I make a decision, um, I do my own research. I don't listen to anybody's opinions and their relationships or, or lack of relationships and how they um, make their decisions. I just follow what I feel like will be for the greater good of not just the 26th Ward, not just the new 10th Ward, but the city as a whole. And that's the direction I go in. And again, sometimes it might be to a fault, but that's how we learn. You know, how we, get, how we learn and how you build up your relationships. What I am is honest and open in communication. And I know that even though people, I like being around people that I don't agree with because people that you agree with sometimes become fake cheerleaders. But when you have people around that you are not in agreement with all the time and you all come to the middle, that's where change happens.
disagreement, but not disunity. Some, some Absolutely. Sort of progress. That's a good, I might use that more. <laughs> Trademarked right here on the record. Uh, before we let you go, a couple uh, other questions about uh, where the city is headed politically and how it might impact the state. Uh, I don't know if you'd be surprised to see Republicans in, in Jeff City maybe try to deny a waiver so that they would force people to have to pay income taxes on this universal basic income mm -hmm. or guaranteed basic income. Mm -hmm. Would you be disappointed to see that happen? Uh, probably absolutely disappointed first, but not surprised. And not surprised, but on another issue that we started out talking about was about police. We've already seen several Republicans file bills to take back uh, local control mm -hmm. away from St. Louis mm -hmm. and put the police department under state control once again which would essentially allow the state to hire the police chief, which Mayor Jones just did for mm -hmm. her first mm -hmm. uh, time, really, a, a, as, as mayor there. Absolutely. Um, I imagine you're opposed to an idea like that, but why? You know, um, I, it's probably not gonna be popular, but I wouldn't say I'm 100% opposed to it right now because I'm still learning and studying it. And when I talk to different You're sides open to a state it, takeover of the city police department. Not a full state takeover, but I mean, when I'm talking to police, officers and I'm specifically because of the relationships again that I'm proud I have and I've built. If there's some way to meet in the middle then that's where I want to be. Um, this right here is going to continue to build discourse and division with us. Anything that moves further toward that cannot be productive for, for public safety for the city of St. Louis. So maybe not a local control, I mean maybe not state takeover, not totally local. Whatever we have to do to find that in the middle is where is where I want to be because again I don't want to be a part of something that continues to divide this and leave these gaps open for our detriment, to mm -hmm. our detriment in public safety here in the city of St. Louis, which is what it's doing. And honestly, I mean, when you talk to one side, one side is on the other. I mean, one side is firmly on their side, the other side is firmly on their side. Again, we have to come in the middle if we're going to move forward. Nobody's going to be able to make change without that. All right, my last question before we let you go, and I appreciate you uh, spending mm -hmm. your afternoon with us here. Uh, you have 27 colleagues in the Board of Aldermen right now, mm -hmm. 28 if you include the president. You will soon have just 13 mm -hmm. if you win re-election mm -hmm. in the spring. When I win. When, she says when. <laughs> Uh, there's going to be this reduction. The people have voted to reduce the size of City Hall, cut it in half, mm -hmm. but you still have the same number of voters. So one alternate person will have twice as many mm -hmm. voters. If you mm -hmm. have twice the duties, should you have twice the pay? There's a bill on the floor right now that mm -hmm. would effectively double your paycheck. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that's, a, that's the magic number, but personally, I think with anyone um, that advocates for their job, for their livelihood, an increase is necessary when you're going up to to your point double the people and double the, the people that you'll have to serve. I mean, um, I don't know what people see on the outside looking in if they don't believe that all the persons should be paid or not paid or a lot of them have side jobs. A, yeah, well, some of them have side jobs, but speaking for myself that I had one and didn't have one after the pandemic and I know the difference. Even with a side job, the salary that the other person has now is not even a living wage for 2022. Right, we're talking so, about 33,000 roughly, I think, going up to 76 yeah, was the number I saw. Maybe it's not right, finalized. Right, and I, that number is, cl is clearly not not uh, finalized. And whatever the number may be, um, I'm going to stand on it that the other people deserve it when they're doing their job. And if you don't like the way or you're not happy with the way your other person is doing their job, we have this thing called an election where you can vote them out. There you go. <laughs> we'll leave it there. You'll have a thing called an election where they yeah, can vote them out. I mean, that's it. But it's a job, like everybody else has a job. And who would not advocate for their value and their job and their work. Alderwoman Shamim Clark Hubbard, thank you for joining us on the record. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to come as we close down 2022, some of the top political moments of this year, and as we get closer to those inaugural events in Illinois and Missouri, all of that coming up in our next episodes of The Record. But until then, we're off the record. <laughs>